All right, folks, back here on the Boston Man Show here with Coach Todd Gold and here of the USF Downs out of the West Coast Conference. Coach, how you doing, man? Good to talk to you again. I'm doing great. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on like always. Yes, indeed. Well, Coach, talk to us, man. Uh, how was it in March for you guys? I know for me, it's my birthday. March, March 11th is my birthday. Everything kind of shut down on my birthday, right? So where were you guys at March 11th, man, in that whole week? And how did that transition go for you guys going on campus to being virtual? How was that, man? Uh, it's, it, it was it was a crazy week, one that uh, one like I've never experienced before in my life. You know, we had just finished uh, – wrapping up a really tough game against Gonzaga in the conference tournament. You know, we lost by like four points in the semis, and we were coming home, and, and really we were just getting ready for the NIT. You know, we were told that we were going to be in the field, and so we were prepping for that. And then just like a bag of bricks, that thing dropped, and, you know, within three or four days, the whole school was, you know, off campus, and everything had moved to virtual learning. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really proud of our guys for the way they handled it. They handled it with a lot of maturity. Uh, you know, finished really strong in the classroom in the spring, and, and it, they didn't let it phase them too much. But I know it was really difficult for them to have their season cut short, especially for the seniors that graduated. Um, and it was just one of those things that you, you just can't prepare for it, right? I mean, once in maybe 100 years type thing. Uh, so with all that being said, it, it, it was good to see uh, our guys finish strong academically, and, and it's great to have everybody on our squad back now. Yeah, I'll talk to you about that academically going from – in person to virtual learning. Now you have the black boys and kind of keep up with the, the blackboard and here to hold them accountable for missing class if they, they can't make them go, go run all the run for you if you miss a class. So how was that keeping the guys accountable to, to the schoolwork, being at home in their own environments? Because I know kids at 20 years old may be like, hey, I'm at home, I can skip this, or this assignment. So how was it keeping them accountable to that, man? I know it had to be difficult for a little bit there. No, you know what? It, honestly, our guys are really good. And, and a big part of it is, you know, we, we kind of sift through and filter a lot of that in the recruiting process. You know, we like getting guys that care about class and, and want to be graduates and guys that uh, are high achievers. You know, they, they obviously want to succeed on the court, but they're proud of doing well in the classroom as well. So it really wasn't that difficult. You know, we, we obviously stress the importance of making sure they were on every call and, and didn't let anything slide, but they did a very good job of of kind of self-checking themselves and making sure that they finish strong. Most definitely. And how did you guys manage where some of them couldn't work out in the summertime or do anything basketball-wise? So how did you kind of manage that with your young men, kind of keep them in some kind of semi-shape until they got back to you? So how, how did that go for you guys over the spring and summer here? Yeah, it, it was tough. You know, we were able to get our guys back in the middle of the summer, uh, and, and we had to really gradually work our way back into the gym. Uh, you know, we had to do a lot of our training, our strength and conditioning outside uh, for the first month or so, which, you know, was, was interesting and it was new. And I think that newness made it pretty fresh for the guys and it kept them focused. Um, but again, they, they took a really workmanlike approach to the way of, of the individual workouts that we had to start with, one ball, one basket. And then we gradually, as we proved that we could maintain our health, we were able to get more and more guys in there. Um, to the point where today, you know, on October 14th, we had our first official practice with our full squad in the gym. So uh, it, it wasn't easy, but, you know, it was one of those things where we knew other people were dealing with a lot of the same stuff. Uh, so, you know, we, we didn't feel sorry for ourselves or make excuses, and we just kept working. Most definitely, and I feel like it's good because season starts at the 25th, so we got six weeks away from it getting started. So I know you don't want to avoid those soft tissue injuries that the guys can get nag them all year long. So is the ramp up being kind of gradual and slow, even though you got them all on the court together, maybe just shooting drills and not so much up and downs so you avoid that nagging ankle or needed because that's going away all year long? No, you, you hit it on the head. That was one of the big things that we recognized as we watched um, – EuroLeague soccer, to be honest, as it was coming back, there was a lot of soft tissue injuries, a lot of hamstring injuries uh, and guys that were dealing with that. So we really kind of systematically built out our approach and, and took our time getting back our cardio and our strength. And that was our main focus for about the first six weeks. Um, very light basketball, you know, uh, shooting, skill stuff, but not a lot of contact. We really wanted to make sure our bodies were back in shape before we got back to the basketball. And for you, Coach Gold, you know, you know, year one, over 20 wins, year one. How did it make you feel being the first time here, Coach, getting 20 wins in year one, which is rare than D1 to do, and what's the conference tough as yours. So how was that, man, finishing fifth in that conference, but being over 20 wins in year one? 
Yeah, it was, you know, I was super fortunate to be able to take over for Kyle when he, when he left to go to Washington State because the program was really, really healthy. And, and to credit to my staff, too, for being able to keep this group together because uh, we, we thought we would have a good team if we were able to do that, and we did. And, uh, you know, we had some ups and we had some downs. And, you know, I was really proud of the way we sustained. And, uh, you know, w when we hit the rough patches, we didn't let it affect us too strongly. And, and that's, you know, we were playing our best basketball at the end of the season. I think we won five out of our last six games. Uh, as we were gearing up to go to the NIT. So, um, you know, I learned a lot. Uh, there, were, there were times where I felt really confident, and there were times where I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. But at the end of the day, it felt like uh, we had a pretty successful season. So uh, I'm just really appreciative of our administration and, and my staff. I thought my staff could do a great, great job. I, I have three really, really talented assistant coaches. And, uh, you know, just having them in practice with me every day gave me the confidence to, to really guide this program. How was it for you going through that year one? I talked to somebody when you first got hired, the adjustment moving over, over six inches is adjustment. So how was the adjustment for you going through it? Actually, for some talk last year, we first got hired. So how was that adjustment for you? Handling all the dele delegation and staff meetings, practice plans, whereas where you're the, the guy making the call. Not doing suggestions anymore. You're making the call now and pulling the trigger on these things. How was that? Yeah, it, it was – It was. there were some times where it was stressful. I, I was definitely a lot more tired this – uh, I, I kind of had to work to make sure I took care of myself and my, my body and made sure I ate right and exercised and did all these little, you know, self-help things to make sure that, you know, I was able to, to stay on my game. Um, but again, like I, I didn't change a whole lot when I got the job. There was obviously some tweaks here and there, some adjustments that we made within our program. But, um, you know, overall, it, it was really just kind of stay the course and, and really focus on on what's important, and, and that kind of led us, and it guided me the right way. Most definitely. Now, I, I enjoy kind of catching you all late night on the, the digital ESPN threes there, seeing you guys play. Like I said, right. I want to make sure I want to make sure you guys are doing because no, for me, when you all play it's midnight over midnight in Atlanta, but I want to make sure I shut <laughs> up some support and make sure I checked in on you. But I saw you had it under control. I said, yeah, he's doing a great job out there. I'm happy for it, you know. So I want to tell you, I stayed up late to watch catch you, man. I did. <laughs> I appreciate it. Hey, when, uh, back when I first got into coaching, I worked at Columbia University in New York City. And obviously, I, I played at St. Mary's. And, and now I, my wife and I used to stay up, you know, usually every Thursday and Saturday till about 1 o'clock in the morning watching the games on the West Coast. So I, I appreciate you for doing that. And I know it's not easy. Yeah, man, but I, I try to show you my support I can, man. You know, I want to make sure I'm checking on my guys I talk to in the show, man. Make sure you're doing good and make sure you're healthy, man. So I, I, I love doing it, man. It was fun, man. It was fun. Good. I love it. Now, Coach, let's talk to you about this, man. So the, the phenomenon of recruiting via Zoom. How was that for you this year? A lot of guys had different opinions about it. So how was it showing the campus via Zoom, getting to know guys and their families via Zoom and recruiting that way? And that's something you'll continue going forward. Nah, you know, honestly, I don't love it. I really don't. Uh, I, I really prefer to meet with, you know, these young student athletes and their families in person and, and get to spend time with them face to face. Uh, is it a little easier? Sure. Um, is it better? I don't think so. And, you know, as we're able to get back out in the recruiting world, you know, January 1st as of today, uh, you know, that's something that we're going to take advantage of and, and kind of go back and pound the streets and make sure we're seeing the guys we need to see and, and maintain the relationships we need to maintain. So I, I really don't love it, um, but it's obviously a necessary thing for us right now. Most definitely. Let me ask you this, Coach. So did it at least expand, expand your reach for you uh, to get the guys maybe you wouldn't maybe get to versus flying to them, going to see them play? Did it help in that regard a little bit for us to get the guys you might not be able to get to originally, kind of stay within a budget of recruiting? How, how did that kind of help you out a little bit there? Yeah, for sure. You know, and we do a lot of stuff internationally. So I think that was, that was you know, beneficial that way. Uh, you know, not, not having to make trips across the water and just doing it, you know, like this. Um, so yeah, in, in that frame, um, it definitely made executing some of the recruiting tasks that we have, you know, a little easier. Now, schedule wise, I know you put in the West Coast Conference, you know, you don't want to play so many guarantee games as guys look in different conferences, but how does it kind of schedule with games during the quarantine rules in different states and having contracts for MTEs and stuff like this? How has it been trying to get games with two weeks? gone that you used to have to play these kind of games now on November 25th is the start date. How has that been trying to fit those in along with getting ready for the WCC, which coming up is going to be tough as well? 
Yeah, you know what? It's been it's been one of the biggest challenges, to be honest. You know, I thought uh, you know Jonathan Sapphire, our director of operations, did a really good job this summer getting our schedule put together, and uh, we had some really really good games on there that we were that were going to challenge us and give us opportunities to get important wins in the non-league. Uh, and I think one of the unintended consequences of moving the season back those two weeks uh, was just blowing up everybody's non-conference schedule. You know, most of the other teams and coaches that I spoken to basically started fresh you know they had 15 or 13 or maybe 11 non-conference games scheduled and they've just kind of been building from the ground up and that's what we've done uh and again you know in these circumstances it, it wasn't easy but I, i'm happy with our how our non-conference is shaping up we're going to go out to the elevate hoops mte in nebraska uh we're going to play lsu and will wade's group out there which will be a really really good game for us and and pick up two other games out there um, and then, you know, we still, we're going to play at Cal in the non-conference, you know, they're just a 30 minute drive over the, the Bay bridge. And, and we have a couple other games that we're really close to signing, um, that I'm excited about. So we'll, we'll get to our 11 non-league games, which is our max here in the West coast conference. And, uh, you know, knowing that it's going to be, uh, an interesting season and there might be some postponements and there might be some things to shake it up. We, we feel like we're doing everything we can to give ourselves the best chance to be successful. Now, Coach, you saw our organization here after what's been going on in our country, Coach Coalition for Progress. So how, how tell me how you that idea to start that, start that organization. Who was all a part of it? And what are you, you guys' mission here going forward? Yeah, I, you know what? It was, it's one of the things that, that I'm most proud of over the last six months. Um, and really with everything that was going on socially, uh, uh, a lot of the unrest across the country, a lot of the issues um, that some of the people of our country were having with police officers, and, you know, I, I just felt like there were a lot of people that were unhappy uh, with the direction that our country was headed. And, and so I took it upon myself, along with Vinnie McGee, who coaches with me here at San Francisco. Uh, we got together and, and we just said, hey, you know, let's let's do something where we can, you know, focus on bringing people together. You know, and I think that's what uh, really is getting lost right now is there's a lot of division out there in the United States. And whether it's political parties or, you know, beliefs based off religion uh, you know, racial beliefs, whatever it may be. Uh, I, I'm concerned because I feel like that gap is widening. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do with, with Vinny and then Carlin Hartman, who's a great dear friend of mine in Oklahoma and, and AJ, Andrew Cooper, who coaches football up at Washington state, who was the best man at my wedding. And then Kevin Hovde and Jonathan Sapphire from my staff, our whole focus was, Hey, let's, let's try to bring people together and raise some money to give back to our underserved communities and try to level the playing field for some of these young kids growing up who might not have all the resources they need to be successful. So it's kind of a two pronged approach. We've also had, uh, you know, building community relationships is a big part of our coalition. So we've had police officers from, uh, you know, the Bay area come and speak to our team and kind of address them in regards to some of the issues that are going on and kind of give their perspective as well. Um, because, you know, obviously a lot of what we see on TV is the worst of police officers. Uh, but, you know, there, there's a lot of great cops as well. And, and I think it was important for our young men to, to meet some of those individuals who are putting their lives on the line to protect us. And, and so they could understand, hey, everything we see on TV is some of that. Is, is that true? Sure. Are there also great people out there that are protecting us? Yes. And, and I think it's important that our young men get an unbiased perspective and they're able to make those decisions uh, by themselves. So, uh, you know, really just trying to strengthen those community relationships. We want to get more into the community when, you know, COVID kind of takes more of a backseat, hopefully over the next couple of months. And uh, again, we're excited to kind of donate uh, the money we've raised to some underserved communities with athletic supplies and academic equipment to better serve these young uh, men and women, well, young boys and girls really, in their academic endeavors as they try to uh, close the gap and give themselves a better opportunity to be successful as they get older. I love about sports because Golden is sports brings us, us together. Like, you know, for me, I was seven years old. I met my first white kid, to be honest with you. It's to travel baseball. It's how I've met a white kid for the first time in my life. Living in Atlanta, I didn't meet any white kids since I was seven years old playing travel baseball. So sports has always, for me, brought me to different cultures, different people, different backgrounds, because sports has been what showed me about life in the world. It got me to go play co in, in college. It's got me in radio. So sports has shown me how I connect with all different kinds of people for all walks of life. And, and I feel like your organization is so good because you're trying to bring us all together. Because we're more closer than we are apart. And that's what people don't realize. 
We're more close than we are apart. No. And sports is a no. good vehicle to bring people together because we all can cheer for that common goal, that common color, that common team to win a game. I feel like he brings us together so, on so many ways, Coach. Hey, you, you hit it on the head, brother. And, and, you know, for me growing up, you know, sports was, was a great – unifier and as you said you know i i feel like at the age of 35 you know I, i've been playing uh you know sports with people that are different than myself my whole life you know so i, I feel very comfortable uh you know i've always had minority teammates and so I, I don't really feel like i've ever seen color but then you go and you look out there in the public spectrum and you do understand that all right there are some people across this country who really have not been around people that don't look like themselves. And so when they see each other, it might not, they might not be as comfortable and they haven't had those experiences, but man, you hit it on the head. Sports is something that is just so important, uh, not only to the identity of the country, but it is a great uh, unifier. It's the great equalizer. It doesn't matter whether you're white, black, yellow, purple, that score is going to start zero, zero at the beginning of the game. Yes. And whatever team wins, win. And uh, it's, it's something that's, you know, been great for me as an individual. And now I'm just trying to pass it down to my players and then to people in the younger generation as they come up. And, and hopefully we can kind of continue to bridge that gap. Yes, indeed. Like I said, you know, for me, coach, I've been inspired to use my show as a better platform to talk about social issues and do something for the community. Like, coach, I'll be honest with you. We got voting here in Georgia going on right now. I'm giving people snacks and drink. When I'm doing interviews, we get out people snacks, drinks, and send them online to vote because I think like that's important because I want to get, encourage them to, hey, it's important that you go out here and vote. So I want to help you. Use my show, to my sponsor, to help you out by giving you food and drinks while you sit in line. So I've been smart to use my show as a platform now going forward to help people in this community of Atlanta and beyond because it's that important to me now. 33 years old, Coach, you're 35. We can make a difference in this country. So us millennials do care about the country. We can get the job done for sure. <laughs> I mean, what you're saying is so true, JR. And like, we, we're doing the same with our group. You know, we, we made it a mandate within our program for our young men to register to vote. And we're not going to talk to them and try to guide them in regards to which way we want them to vote, but we want to educate them so they understand the value of voting. And the val that's one of the biggest freedoms we have, right, is to go out and, and place our vote for whatever man or woman we feel like is best uh, to sit in that chair, whether it's the presidency or the local elections, which, to be honest, in some cases are more important yes. than the presidential race. And, you know, just for our young men within our program to understand the power that they have, their constitutional right to go out and vote, it's, uh, it's one of the most important things we can do. Most definitely. I've been so inspired, Coach Golden, by what's been going on in this country. You know, my mom and dad were, grew up in the 60s, so they was around Martin Luther King, and they was around those marches. So, you know, my fam, my fam, my parents were, were from that era. They bought their there in the 70s. So my parents, I, I, I was one of those menopause babies, as they say. <laughs> so I always wanted to be here. <laughs> you know, so they're older, so they tell me about the story. So for me to be able to use my platform that I have here and be able to make a difference, Coach, it's so heartwarming. It feels good to be able to help the community, help the city of Atlanta, help the people of Georgia grow and, and move forward, not get stuck in a, in a rut and say we can move with this situation here forward. Like like you said, local minds more than federal because like mass mandates here in Georgia are not a thing, you know? So you're right. It matters more locally than it does on the federal level for sure. Yeah, there's no doubt. And I think it's, uh, again, the best we can do is try to educate people within our platform and just create that opportunity an understanding of our rights. And, and if people choose to take advantage of it, great. And if they don't, that's their decision. Got that right, Coach Golden. Thank you for your time, man. As always, good to catch up with you. I'll be cheering for you again this year. I'll be looking to catch you late night like, once more, man. Hoping you guys get those wins out there and the WCC, man, for sure. Yeah, I appreciate you, man. Hopefully we'll, we'll get some earlier games so you don't have to stay up so late this year. But I appreciate <laughs> you having me on. It's always great catching up with you, man. And, uh, Reach out if you ever need anything out west, okay? No, okay. Dave, it's good to see you this time, too. Good to see you. I always talk to you. I'm on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, bro. Hey, you stay safe out there, okay? You too now, Coach. Be good, man. All right. Take, take care. All right, now. See you.